Good morning, and thank you for being here with us virtually today. My name is Erin Corcoran, and I'm the Executive Director of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, housed at the Keough School of Global Affairs. I want to welcome all of you to the 22nd Annual Dialogues on Nonviolence, Religion, and Peace. This year's presenter is Dr. Aza Karem, an experienced scholar and practitioner of peace building, religion, and international politics. And her talk is entitled Multi-Faith Actions, The Tipping Point for Peace. <clears throat> the Dialogues for Nonviolence, Religion, and Peace began in 1999, and which was established through a gift from, to the Kroc Institute from Anne Marie Yoder and her family. Although Anne Marie passed away in September 2019, we are grateful for the many ways she supported the Kroc Institute during her life and we acknowledge with gratitude the members of the Yoder family who are present with us online today. We are very fortunate today to have Dr. Ibrahim Musa, the Mirza family professor of Islamic thought and Muslim societies serving as the moderator for this conversation. As a senior faculty member at the Keough School of Global Affairs and the Kroc Institute, he is helping to lead the school's initiative on global religion and human development he also co-directs with Scott Appleby and Atalia Omar, Contending Modernities, a global research and education initiative exploring the ways religion and secular forces interact in the modern world. I will now turn the virtual mic over to him to introduce this year's speaker and explain the format of the program. Thank you, Dr. Musa and Dr. Karem. Thank you, Erin, uh, and welcome everybody. For those of you who have just joined, my name is Ibrahim Musa, and I'm honored to introduce our guest today and moderate this conversation. Our lecture for the 22nd Annual Dialogues on Nonviolence, Religion, and Peace, hosted by the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies in the Keough School of Global Affairs, is Professor Azza Karam, a longstanding friend. Professor Karam, at present, serves as the Secretary General of an NGO called Religions for Peace that had a longer a long history and a different name uh, that I was familiar with. And it's the largest multi-religious religious, religious leadership platform with 90 national and six regional inter-religious councils. She also holds a professorship of religion and development at the Free University in Amsterdam in the Netherlands of which she is a citizen. Prior to her role in the Religions for Peace, Professor Karam had a long and distinguished career at the United Nations. She served as a senior advisor on culture at the United Nations Population Fund and also served as coordinator and chair of the UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. There, she coordinated engagement with members of a global interfaith network for population and development with over 600 faith-based organizations from all regions of the world representing all religions and interreligious affiliation. She is the lead facilitator for the United Nations Strategic Learning Exchanges on Religion, Development and Diplomacy of Great Interest to people affiliated to the Kroc Institute and the Keough School. And this builds on a legacy of serving as a trainer come facilitator of intercultural leadership and management in the Arab region, as well as Europe, and Central Asia. Professor Karam has served in different positions in the UN since 2004, as well as other intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations since the early 1990s, and has lectured around the world and in the US. Her PhD in 1996 focused on the topic of political Islam, which was published in her Arabic, in Arabic first, her mother tongue, and in English, and I would say that Women, Islamisms and the State, Contemporary Feminisms in Egypt, and a very important book, in my view, remains a critical text and a must read for anyone seeking to gain a nuanced understanding of the complex story of Islam, law, gender debates and politics in modern Egypt. Professor Karam engages in difficult conversations with herself as an ethnographer and is unafraid to share her own location and altering experiences with her religiously committed as well as secular interlocutors. Needless to say, the women she interviewed were committed to different perspectives of faiths and ideas of womanhood compared to her own. And it was precisely her openness to engage with these faith-based groups 
and her willingness to understand their perspectives on their own terms that the story she tells is most credible. It is also why her own self-critique of her own positionality vis-a-vis -vis those of her interlocutors becomes so believable. She explains how she came to different positions about herself after listening carefully to her interlocutors. And she treats key intellectuals like Zainab al-Ghazali, Safina Kazim, and Hiba Raouf and their insights both appreciatively and critically. And needless to say, she was among the first to academically make those voices heard. And I regret to say that some of these voices still do not res resonate in the complex mix of the subsequent literature on the subject. What marks Professor Karam's work is that she's prepared to listen to unfamiliar voices and consider those views that might challenge her own and those of the status quo. She is the first to admit that religious arguments perpetuate harmful practices such as early, forced, and child marriages. It is also for this reason that as an advocate of human rights, she believes that religious actors must be among the most prominent parts of the solution, as she concluded in a 2015 Review of Faith and International Affairs article. Professor Karam has published extensively on topics of religion, gender, development, and issues related to peace and security, international political dynamics, including democratization, human rights, and sustainable development. Religion is always front and center in her thinking, and she excels in problematizing each of these complex concepts as that she studies. It is my pleasure and great honor to invite Professor Azza Karam to deliver the 22nd Annual Kroc Institute Lecture. She will deliver her remarks, followed by Q&A, and you are kindly invited to text your questions. Her talk is part of a series titled Dialogues on Nonviolence, Religion and Peace. And the title for today's presentation is Multi-Faith Actions, The Tipping Point for Peace. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, please help me to welcome Professor Azza Karam virtually. Thank you very, very much indeed, Professor Musa. You have honored me greatly. I am I'm humbled by, I don't know who you were talking about, but I really appreciated the way that you have indeed, you, you appear to have read the thesis, which I'm deeply grateful to you for. And, and I think you've been very generous in how you have characterized me. Um, as, as many of the people who I've worked with over the years know, your work has been very seminal and important for those of us studying the intersection of religion, politics, uh, and life. Um, so I, I am indeed extraordinarily honored to be introduced by you, to be able to see you again and be in this space with all uh, the colleagues. I'm very grateful to the Kroc Institute for honoring me with the opportunity to be with you here today. Um, I am grateful that you also mentioned the, the, the book, the very first book that I was able to um, research, work, and, and write. And I am indeed going to refer to this in my conversation with you. So, so bear with me a little as, um, as I just read a few thoughts that I wanted to share in the context of this conversation about multi-faith actions and peace. When I speak of religions, I refer to the realms inclusive of diverse religious leaders, religious institutions, religious communities, religiously inspired NGOs or non-governmental organizations. Clearly, these realms are vast and thus difficult really to speak of in any universalized, generalized or essentialized manner. And yet the mistake is often made frequently more so to speak of religion and development, religion and gender, religion and environment, religion and foreign policy, and so on. This form of essentialization creates multiple opportunities for misunderstanding, especially, albeit not only, when implicit or explicit references are made to terrorism, fundamentalism, political violence, extremism, as part of this religion and dot, 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 fill in it blanks. Now, having identified that, please bear with me as I too somewhat commit this faux pas as I seek to share what are principally experiential narratives. As a development practitioner, now that literally means someone who's working on designing and implementing programs related to health, to education, to democratization, women's rights, 
in diverse organizations and in different parts of the world. But also as a scholar of religion and development, I try, often unsuccessfully by the way, to do the work, both the work and to think about it. I emphasize the word unsuccessfully. So again, I do beg your pardon for the obvious shortcomings I am a living example of, for I cannot but personify the adage, jack of all trades, master of none. So far from seeking to expound on set, evolving or new theories in this space, I rather seek to share a few stories um, and some of the lessons that I am learning uh, in the process of observing and partaking of much of the international development, human rights and peace and security work. Over the last three decades, I have worked from within religious non-governmental organizations, but also secular human rights organizations, intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, but also like International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Um, and obviously the context of specific uh, NGOs throughout this time and, and, and academia throughout this time and from within each of these institutions human rights both the content of the universal declaration of human rights but also the amendments and actions around it um, the legislation relevant to it have served more or less as a cornerstone as a the guiding uh, element and driver of so much of my work in the late 1980s, I set out to research and to work within human rights non-governmental organizations on the nexus between Islamic fundamentalism, then I defined as the, the Muslim Brotherhood, I gave an example of the Muslim Brotherhood and its various offshoots over time, and the link between, therefore, Islamic fundamentalism, government and governance dynamics, and I focused very much on Arab states. <laughs> But I was looking at how this particular nexus of political Islam governance impacts on human rights issues and as a signifier, as a litmus test of the human rights dynamics, I focused on and I was actually forced to focus on and I'll explain why in a second, but I focused on women's rights and women's and legislation concerning women. I had no intention of focusing on the women aspect at that time. But due to the fact that I was apparently identified as some kind of a security concern by my own government at that time, and I was advised, and I quote, focus on women instead of looking at political Islam and uh, government things that are dangerous, focus on women. The notion being that that focus would make my security context a little bit less threatening um, for our establishments, our ruling and governance establishments. And indeed, they did me a big favor. I did focus on women as the litmus test of human rights in the uh, relationship between governance and political Islam. So therein comes the book that you very kindly referred to. Now, bear with me. I, I have a feeling you'll be squirming in your seats, Dr. Musa, but I want to talk a little bit about the flamenco dance of religion politics and human rights. This is not to minimize the importance of this dynamic, but it is to try to give an allegory, a metaphor for what is happening. You see, the central thesis that I worked with 30 years ago turns out to remain rather pertinent till today. Very simply and rather crudely put, and making allowance for some adjustments and wordings, the thesis I used and I tried to, uh, to unpack then which is, till today, that religion and politics are central to governance and that religious rhetoric and religious movement as the relationship between political parties and political discourse and religious rhetoric and religious movements, as that relationship evolves, clashes, swirls guardedly, synergizes, distances, growls, mimics, as that happens, human rights is either the elusive prize or the shattered glass, which is both injured and injures. I see politics and the political discourses around us as the singer. Remember that in a trio of flamenco, there's a singer, there's a guitarist, and there's a dancer. 
Politics for me is the singer. Sentiments and the um, religion for me, the sentiments, the institutions, the organizations affiliated to it, um, then becomes the, the very fundamental part of um, the ambience. The musician, the guitarists, are then the religion. Human rights, especially matters of gender, which define and inform the basis of all human relations, then becomes the flamenco dancer. Okay, so let me let me just say that again. Politics is the singer. Um, religion, the musicians and the guitarist. Human rights, the flamenco dancer. The guitarist and the singer will each work with one another and respond to as well as shape one another's tempos. But they both also respond to as well as adapt sometimes to the dancer and they set, they tend to set the trend of the dance. In other words, politics and religion set the trend of what happens with the human rights agenda. But the human rights agenda also influences how the musicians and the guitarists will play. As the tempo of the music and the singing rise to diverse crescendos, so too does the dancer in his or her movements. It is rare for a flamenco performance to finish without the chests of each of the guitarist, the singer, and the dancers heaving with the efforts of their movements and pouring with the sweat of the performance. And thus it is to my mind that our geopolitics strum the guitar to and with the singing voices of religious institutions and their leaders, using religious discourses as their verse. And our human rights dance in a merciless, macabre, yet somehow colorful and predictable sometimes beats, movements and tempos, at least predictable to those like us who have observed, studies, studied and sometimes even dance. But before I share the dance I did with you, and before you laugh me out of this space, I invite you to think of examples of this flamenco dance unfolding around us, and we are all witness to today. Russia, Ukraine, and the Orthodox churches, the relationship that happened between two nations that ultimately led to a split in one of the oldest religious institutions of the world. Iran and Saudi Arabia and their satellite governing regimes with their clerical establishments. The United States administrations and the evangelicals, both in the United States and abroad in many parts of Africa. Think of India and the RSS, the Rashtriya, Swaya, Swayam Sevak Sangh, and the Hindu BJP. Think of Myanmar, Sri Lanka, some of their Buddhist leaders, Pakistan and its divided and dividing clergy, Egypt with its Al-Azhar and its Sinai-based ISIS-styled insurgents. And then think also, perhaps not as vividly, of European states with their Catholic and Lutheran establishments. The Vatican and its Pope, now an active part of the geopolitics of environment, health, peace, and now lately also the universal call to brotherhood and for human fraternity. In other words, it isn't such a far-fetched idea. Indeed, it is very much part of our world that religion and politics set the tone, the trend for human rights issues and dynamics, and that human rights issues and dynamics also are very much part of what happens within this relationship between the religious and the politics, the singer and the guitarist. So, I will now describe the flamenco of human rights that I danced and still do. I choose to share the story of my work with the United Nations from within a multi-religious international NGO as well. So I will share this work from the perspective of what I did for nearly two decades in the United Nations and the work that we are doing in Religions for Peace now. In order to describe the human rights dynamics, I need to explain some basic features of those on the stage with the dancers, namely the different politics, singers, encountered, which in turn inform and are informed by 
the music of religious discourse and actors. In Religions for Peace, the organization I have the distinct privilege and responsibility to serve today. The organization is composed of religious leaders representing religious institutions. That includes Al-Azhar, the Vatican, Anglican Communion, the churches, etc. But also religious communities. Um, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain, Baha'i, indigenous peoples groups. Effectively, we think of religions for peace as the United Nations of religions, in the same way that the United Nations has member states, governments, religions for peace has member religious institutions and religious communities. This, among the, this plethora of, of membership and, uh, and uh, work, Women leaders, both ordained, obviously, will exist in fewer numbers. So therefore, we tend to ensure that among the faith communities we have with us and we require that our religious institutional members identify the women and the youth leaders. Leaders here, not in the sense of ordained, but also only, but also in the sense of those who are working within their communities, within their religious institutions, and leading significant numbers of project and work. So we have the women and the youth voices from across the religious spectrum as very important members alongside the ordained main male religious leaders of representing their respective religious institutions. Altogether, these constitute the board of this one non-governmental organization called Religions for Peace or World Conference of Religions for Peace. Alone, each of these religious institutions and communities are actually galaxies. Together, they constitute a large part of our musical universe of religions because the Vatican is a massive galaxy. And together with all the other religious institutions, we are speaking of a universe of religions. Now, in the United Nations, which is a distinct galaxy of stars in and of itself, 193 government members set the political and practical tones of engagement. I maintain that these political actors, the member states, the governments, are also the flamenco singers. They are internally losing plenty of institutional credibility in and among their own populations as they struggle to deliver on basic social contracts where they actually have them and have honored them. The coronavirus has seriously attacked their pre-existing conditions. I'm talking about the governments now. The coronavirus has seriously attacked their pre-existing conditions of institutional weakness and loss of credibility and rendered many of them even weaker and more heavily dependent on the security ventilators of armies and police. Even the most democratic of member states or governments today are struggling to uphold a record of human rights observance that is tolerable. When they come together in the United Nations, especially in its key decision-making body of the Security Council, these groups of singers set political tones which are seriously discordant, horribly out of tune, and quite frankly, often gut-wrenching. There is little music, or that is little worthy principled politics, worth listening to in these UN spaces, in this particular UN space. All the more reason then to appreciate the tunes and cadence and rhythm that are actually harmonious within such a space. That is why we can and indeed we must appreciate why when the UN General Assembly met to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, after two years of wrangling, there were literally tears running down the cheeks of some of the most stolid diplomats diplomats and staff members of this system. It had been a heck of a journey to bring the world together to agree on the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. And 193 governments agreed, not only agreed against all odds, our otherwise dysfunctional interna international system 
our combined music of politics has actually provided us with musical notes to which 193 governments not only co-authored with one another and thousands of members of a global civil society and even business and scientific communities, but they actually adopted, meaning they agreed to hold themselves and each other accountable to this. What else was so significant about this particular agenda? Agenda 2030, or the Sustainable Development Goals. When we're asking that, we're actually trying to distinguish in addition from the already amazing fact that these global development goals were adopted, again, I keep saying, by 193 governments who allowed their mechanism, the United Nations, to consult with their own governmental institutions, including executive and judiciary branches, their own civil societies, businesses and corporations, scientific communities, and then agreed to be held accountable to these goals rich and poor governments alike. So yes, in addition to that, the Sustainable Development Goals actually put into measurable bits and pieces all the objectives of the three main foundations of what the United Nations system stands for and upholds. Peace and security, human rights, and sustainable development. Those three came together and are now measurable in terms of what the world is doing in Agenda 2030, i.e. the Sustainable Development Goals. Human rights are no longer a standalone set of goals and objectives, but they are the foundation as well as the conceptual and practical indicators, of which we have 169, by the way, 169 indicators for the Agenda 2030. Human rights are almost measurable. Of course, this is not perfect. Of course, it doesn't capture everything that's going on and everything that we all need to hold ourselves accountable to, different institutions and so on. But guess what? It is a significant set of an agenda and the process of it still is extremely significant. So that's why when I share with you the story of how the UN system engaged with religious voices around peace, i.e. the musicians, guitarists of the flamenco, I will speak to the processes which took place in and around Agenda 2030. For Agenda 2030, for my purposes, at least in this presentation, is a comprehensive agenda of peace as defined by 193 governments within and by their one and only multilateral mechanism, the United Nations. Rather than bore you, I will just simply walk you through what work I did in the UN system. The very first forum which brought together all the different faith-based organizations and religious leaders who had been working with different UN entities in many of the development and humanitarian spaces, that very first forum was held in 2008 by UNFPA, the organization I had moved from UNDP to join in 2007. It was not the very first time that the United Nations brings together religious leaders. On the contrary, on, in the millennium, the United Nations brought together a thousand religious leaders from around the world to affirm what was then the Millennium Development Goals Agenda. This, however, that I speak to in 2008 is the first forum that convened faith-based and faith-inspired humanitarian and development NGOs who are partner to serve and work with and deliver with the United Nations myriad entities, this was the first time they were convened as UN system partners working alongside the United Nations in its various uh, entity iterations. This began what then we established as a global faith network. Over time, this network grew to encompass over 600, apologies, 600 faith-based and faith-inspired non-governmental organizational actors, all with a track record of partnering with the United Nations system entities at regional, national, and global levels. It was the first time that the UN put together such a database of partners. I also worked in 2008 with UN and its colleagues to develop the very first strategy on engaging with faith-based actors around prevention and treatment of HIV and AIDS. It transpires that HIV and AIDS and the engagement around it was the 
opening of the doors for the classic UN practitioners, policy actors, to understand why and how it is that religions matter in the business that they're trying to work on. Because religious communities were responsible for a significant amount of the stigmatization around HIV positive folks. And that is why they had to be identified as people we had to work with in order to help change some of the mindsets and discriminatory practices and stigmatization that they were very much responsible for. But also, also because, frankly, a very significant number of health services around the world are actually provided by and through religious organizations. So whether it was because of the stigma or whether it was because of the healing and the prevention, these religious actors and institutions became very critical counterparts to the work of the United Nations system in working with and on prevention, treatment, and care of HIV and AIDS. The same year, in 2008, I worked with my UNFPA colleagues in different country offices to develop the first ever guidelines for engaging faith-based organizations as cultural agents of change. We thought they were a big deal at that time because for the first time we'd actually sat down and thought about what it would take to work with faith-based actors. What do we mean by faith-based actors? What does the term FBO actually refer to? And so on. But I have to say, these guidelines were significantly improved upon and refined by later iterations from colleagues in UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, UNDP, and many others over time. So what we thought was a big step actually became the very first step in a rising uh, ladder of incredibly important engagements and reflections on how the UN system works with religious actors and organizations in their various hues and shapes. In 2010, with the approval and guidance of the uh, six UN Undersecretary Generals and Executive Directors of different UN entities, I founded and chaired the UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. Why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because every single time we have a new leader inside the United Nations system, the issue of UN reform becomes very pertinent and very important. And ver invariably, there are a few suggested strategies for how this reform has to and should take place and what it would look like. Um, in the era the, of the transition between Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon, um, the issue of delivering as one i.e. because the United Nations system galaxy is so vast and has many different stars in it, how is it that this system should and could and must deliver in a coordinated, cohesive, to the extent possible, fashion so that it can serve government, civil society and everyone else much better. So delivering as one became the mantra. How do you do that practically when you have a gazillion and one different UN entities working on very similar issues, but some working in very specific niche areas? How do you do that? Well, how about an interagency set of mechanisms that brings together all of the folks working in the same space, so that all of the UN folks working in the same space, so that there could be a better sense of who's doing what, an allocation of tasks, and a refining of the work done to indeed deliver as one. Interagency modalities became one of the means of trying to serve and honor this principle of delivering as one, which would reform, uh, which would be a means of reforming the UN system's way of um, not only being seen, but of conducting its operations and making its policies with governments and so on and so forth. So we established a UN interagency task force on religion and development. We started with six UN system entities who each had in their own historical memory and currently been working with different religious actors on the specific issues of their agenda. This interagency task force grew um, to become inclusive of 22 UN system entities. Uh, World Health Organization, the World Bank, UNDP, UNICEF, I can't read out 22, but it's, it's, a, it's a constellation of UN system entities who are each working on and with and about religion and religious actors and religious NGOs. Now, in 2018, as a culmination to this systematic form of engagement, we also founded the Multi-Faith Advisory Council. The 22 system, UN system entities nominated their three top faith-based partners the folks they had worked with, the organizations they had worked with systematically for a number of years, whom they would be prepared to stand up and, and defend if need be, um, 
And that formed those, those nominations of the UN's most steadfast faith-based NGO partners around the world. Then their CEOs became the Multi-Faith Advisory Council to the United Nations Interagency Task Force. In other words, we sought to institutionalize the outreach to build on the request of these different faith-based organizations who, since they had been systematically convened from 2007 to 2018, were getting a little bit tired of always being called around the table to speak. They demanded that they have an opportunity to advise the UN system in how it is working because they noticed that regardless of interagency modalities and UN reform, they kind of noticed that the UN entities still behaved in very different ways and still somehow called upon the same partners to do different things. It didn't appear terribly well coordinated, shall we say. And they felt that their wisdom as faith-based NGOs working with the UN is also a valid credibility and should be used to not only inspire, but also to advise the UN system entities on what works better when you're working with and partnering with religious organizations to achieve the same objectives. As a founding member and convener of this uh, UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development, I started hosting, as I was saying, several different um, events, uh, conferences, seminars, um, policy roundtables from 2008 onwards. And in 2010, started what we now call the strategic learning exchanges, which are really peer-to-peer -peer learning modalities. We bring to the table the UN staff, who are policy advisors, program developers, national program officers, who then meet their counterparts from the faith-based NGOs. And together, they discuss and assess the joint work they're actually doing. The case studies they bring with them become the way that they unpack how it is that they work distinctly, how it is that they work together, and how it is that they may address some of the same common themes being confronted by the globe together. These strategic learning exchanges challenged the UN's culture of power relations, in which civil society actors are often the poorer relatives who have something to learn from the more um, enlightened United Nations folks. The challenge was successful. Today, I think the word humility comes a little bit more easily to the lips of many of our UN leaders of currently serving. Uh, in each of these strategic learning exchanges, we made sure to have one government partner at the table as well. So it was a conversation between the religiously inspired and religiously motivated non-governmental organizations partnering with different UN system entities and usually with the support and the watchful eye of a government. Um, many, many things that then later happened. In total, I calculated conservatively that per year, I served the UN system in hosting an average of about 20 consultations, um, like I said, either conferences, seminars, or policy roundtables and at least one strategic learning exchange, which the average participation there was about 70 to 85 different partners from the UN system. So that by the end, the number of UN system staff who had been trained and who had been at this table of peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange with their respective faith-based counterparts was about 500 UN staff. This is obviously not counting some of the other research work that was being done on the side in order to try to come to terms with what it is that was happening and unfolding. I rejoined Religions for Peace in March of this year, and I implemented three of the lessons that I had learned from the UN experience of engagement. And this, these lessons will share with you some of those reflections that I'd like to be able to provoke you a little bit with. The first lesson was that the United Nations remains fundamentally hampered when it comes to multi-religious engagement. The task force guidelines that we develop, the UN Interagency Task Force guidelines that we develop, say, say as number one that we must be intentional about engaging diverse religions simultaneously so that we don't appear to be prioritizing any one religion or religious act or religious belief because of the fact that we're only meeting regularly with that one uh, or, or indeed having that one religious act or belief, even if they're extraordinarily diverse, the ecumenical community is very diverse, but it's still Christian. So the rule number one, so to speak, in the guidelines said, 
diversify the outreach to all the religious actors simultaneously as often as possible. The, the pushback from some of my colleagues in the UN system was, yeah, but we're working in countries where the majority religions are X. So why would we, what, what would be the value of working with the others? Well, it's precisely because there are minorities that you actually have to work with everybody. But it's interesting that this notion that why would we need to work multi-religiously it was there and still tends to pervade a great deal of our of the challenges of working from within the UN system. It also has to do with the fact that the galaxies of the religious universe actually far outweigh the UN. So the average UN staffer or entire office has actually limited abilities to properly map out and engage the range of religious actors in any one country in a way that is even remotely comprehensive. The world of religion is much more complicated, much bigger than the world of the UN and secular civil society actors, which is the traditional partners. How it, difficult is it to be able to get a grasp of everything, everything religious that's going on in one particular country, let alone the world, it is difficult. So therefore there's also lessons to be learned from how the United Nations has engaged with civil society in general, secular civil society. And we learn, those of us who are willing enough to be critical, we realize that the United Nations system has not exactly excelled in engaging with the civil society actors either. A lesson in point that I thought was a lesson in point was what happened during the Arab Spring, when the UN system was so quick to say, good grief, what on earth is this? What has happened that we're being attacked? And the truth of the matter was that at least as far as Egypt is concerned, no, the United Nations offices were not being attacked. It was rather unfortunate that one particular United Nations office had seen fit out of the entire demography of religious of buildings in the in the massive um, capital of Cairo to house their offices right in the same building which the first lady then had her own sponsored body the National Commission of Women to be so when folks were indicating that they were rather annoyed with the current establishment and government including the first lady and her work they ended up targeting and standing around the building that was inclusive of that particular UN entity. It was not about the UN entity. It was about um, the regime in Egypt in that point in time. But what was most significant was the response of, oh, we're being attacked as the United Nations. Well, maybe, and maybe not. In fact, however, the UN still has a way to go to refine its appreciation of civil society in general, let alone its understanding of where the religious realms fit into those civic realms. But there's also another very important feature of why the UN offices can sometimes be seriously hampered in their outreach to and with different religious actors in one country. Any UN office in a country can refine its ability to identify and partner with NGOs and academia only insofar as the government of that country allows them to do so. This fact is lost on many observers who critique the UN and its impact in any one country. Several UN representatives have been declared persona non grata, PNG, or the verb that we've uh, developed is PNG. If a government deems they have gone too far out of the approved diameters of engaging with non-governmental actors. To be PNG is not only to be kicked out of the country, uh, as, a, as a representative of the United Nations, but it is in fact to have the entire UN office or offices and their services and their capacities to exist seriously curtailed. Any UN office is limited to how much, how well and how efficiently it can engage civil society actors by the very same governments on which this UN entity is dependent for their existence in that country. In other words, to the extent that the government's own relationships with its own civil society are open, democratic, comprehensive, etc., then the UN's relationship with that civil society in the same country will reflect that. Now, let's face it, UN offices tend to exist in countries which don't necessarily have a thriving relationship with their civil society actors. So therefore, the UN offices in those countries reflect exactly the same tensions and limitations of appreciation of civil society and the activism there. And it's no wonder, actually, when you add religion to that civil society context, it's no wonder that many UN entities preferred not to get involved with religious actors at all, especially considering how many regimes in different parts of the world, political regimes, are beginning to have specific tension, not beginning, have 
long had specific tensions or fairly special relationships with their respective religious institutions, usually never with every single religious representative institution, but with specific ones. So seeing that particular dynamic out, it is not un, un, unfair to us to understand that many UN actors preferred not to get involved in that particular space because heaven knows it's contentious enough. So therefore, quite frankly, there are clear limitations on the extent to which UN entities in countries can reach out to the broader inclusive civil society space. And we were all already complaining of serious restrictions on global civil society. So guess what? That also means it makes it a great deal more difficult for UN entities to engage credibly in that space, let alone engage with all the religions in that civic space. Enter Religions for Peace, which has interreligious councils, legally registered, incorporated, non-governmental organizations, made up of representatives of all the religious institutions and communities in any one country, working together for many years now on various aspects of social development, uh, social and economic and uh, development projects, programs, humanitarian services, relief when and where needed, Indeed, these religions for peace interreligious councils are actually an easy to see, legally established, multi-religious space where the religious institutions and communities, i.e. leaders and grassroots, are already developed, working with a legacy of work. So, heavens, why do we need, as UN system entities, to start the process of identifying and mapping and figuring out who's who and who do we go to and who does the government like and who does the government not like? The interreligious councils are there already. Theirs is the cross, forgive me for the pun, to establish themselves legitimately, to have value added, to indeed deliver on what is expected of them in terms of advocacy, but also in terms of actual practical relief uh, and services and development. So, here is a perfect counterpart to the United Nations system offices in countries and abroad. And therefore, my job has been to ensure that we can position these actors, these interreligious councils, more visibly to the UN system entities busy working to deliver on the development, peace and security, and human rights mandates. The second lesson I learned from the experience in the UN system is that until today, the UN system still errs on the side of working more with Christian entities, ecumenical, but still Christian entities. Let me repeat that. The United Nations system actors still tend to err on the side of more representation, more engagement with Christian actors and NGOs. There is proof and evidence of this galore in many of the UN system entities who have tried to track their engagement with the religious actors in this space, the truth is, it's a lot easier to identify Christian non-governmental actors, Christian establishment and entities, a lot easier to identify them because they are structured in ways very similar to the way that the UN and any other government establishment is structured. You have a church, you have affiliated bodies, you have the NGOs affiliated to the church. The world, the map of engagement of, of Christian actors is much easier to see and therefore to reach out to. However, that may explain Indeed, why various UN system entities still tend to work more with Christian actors and consult more with Christian actors, it is not a justification of that. And given that we must appreciate that peace cannot be built by prioritizing one religious group or community or institution over another, that in fact that is a formula for discontent rather than for consensus and partnerships, particularly when many conflicts we're seeing today, intra-state conflicts, but inter-state conflicts, many of these are taking, whether realistically or not, but they're taking a particular religious hue to them. So the more intense the discourse around and about and by religion, the more complicated and intense the social discord actually becomes. Appearing to be more knowledgeable of, or more engaged with, or more comfortable with certain religious communities actually threatens the UN's ability to be neutral and to appear unbiased in general and in times of crises tinged by religious affiliations in particular. Very few of the United Nations faith-based organization partners out of a roster of the 600 plus that I shared with you earlier, very few are actually multi-faith in composition and outreach. 
Some of them still reach out and still serve their own religious ilk, and some prefer to work alone as opposed to working with one another. Some of the most prominent among these FBOs are still pulled up or admonished by certain governments for proselytization while delivering needed services. I know this because I compiled the roster based on the kinds of partnerships the UN system entities were sharing and documenting. By being diligently multi-faith, we are not just observing a luxury or considering an afterthought. In my opinion, it's a fundamental act of peacemaking and peace building with and through religious discourse, institutions, and diverse ranges of practitioners. So this brings me to the third lesson. Precisely because of the above patterns and trends, many UN entities are increasingly engaging with faith-based organizations who are actually, some of them, cherry-picking which human rights they are comfortable to champion and stand up for. Most religious organizations, the bigger, even more, for instance, the Holy See or Lazar, tend to be most comfortable taking specific issues in the human rights gamut and frankly abstaining from, at best abstaining from supporting other issues in that continuum of human rights. There's, there's, it's a legitimate mandate. They wish to see things from their particular religious perspective. What they see may not appear to be in full alignment with the human rights agenda in its entirety. So they choose what they will anyway be speaking to. And they don't do it by deliberately selecting a human rights issue, but this is their MO, their modus operandi. You can see this particular selectivity on issues of gender, which includes the very, very sensitivities around abortion, LGBTIQ, and all the sex-related sensitivities, quite frankly, that many political systems tend to play with. Here in the United States, we're beginning to see how certain aspects of these gender-related issues are becoming so central and have become so central to determining the course of a victor in an electoral enterprise. So the human rights, religion, politics, flamenco dance is very central stage right here, but elsewhere in the world. It becomes more heated and more exhausting for the civic and political infrastructure of our shared global polity. Again, Religions for Peace is the only multi-religious organization bringing together and representing all religious institutions of the world, including indigenous peoples, with youth, with women's rights networks, which has the widest reach and voices, the most varied of service to an agenda of peace and security, human rights, and sustainable development. It's also the only organization that is committed to the Sustainable Development Goals or Agenda 2030 with a clear and unequivocal voice that these religious institutions are committing to working to realize gender equality and women's empowerment. This flamenco dance is honoring the dancer human rights. There are many more things that I can share with you, but I'm fairly sure some of you have already fallen asleep. So let me just share a few more things that perhaps may wake you up. COVID was a moment in which I assumed wrongly that all of the religious communities were going to step up to the plate together. I was half right, all the religious communities, the original responders in humanitarian crisis indeed did step up. They stepped up big time. I'm not sure how many of you are aware that here in Central Park, um, there was a massive ICU, intensive care unit set up um, by one such faith-based organization. They set it up not because it was a luxury, they set it up because at the peak of when New York City was an epicenter of the coronavirus epidemic, there was a clear shortage of services. And the Samaritan's Purse stepped up to the plate honorably and provided the intensive care unit. Now, two things about that particular episode. It was much needed. It was very necessary. It served everyone. It was not selective in who it served by any stretch of the imagination. And it reflects a long legacy of that particular organization's record of service. The issue is, however, that perhaps some of the Samaritan's pers Samaritan Purse's perspectives on other aspects of gender could be taken issue with from a human rights perspective, in fact are. But not only that, when they were approached by other religious organizations to cooperate with them, to support them, to collaborate, the faith-based organization in question preferred to do it alone. And they are not alone in that. Many, many of the largest and wealthiest faith-based non-governmental organizations who are stepping up to the plate in every corner of the world to serve communities in dire need as a result of the pandemic 
many of them prefer to do it alone. And my question is, why? Why would we not come together deliberately, deliberately, to work together to support one another? We're supporting the same people. We're serving the same needs. We're all facing the same crisis. Why do we insist on using our own systems, our own mechanisms, and sticking to our own ways of doing things? And if a global pandemic isn't going to force us to come to terms with the fact that, you know what? It isn't just enough to serve from your religious institutional perspective. It is actually an imperative to work together. Why? Because quite frankly, religious actors anyway are fashioning, modeling, influencing what is happening in our political and in our social and in our developmental and financial spaces. So if this is indeed what is happening, which it is, then working separately, each religious entity working separately to deliver and to influence surely is not a model for social cohesion. Quite the opposite, in fact. If each these, of these religious actors are working distinctively separately, yes, indeed serving millions, indeed one cannot do without. But the point is, why serve distinctly? That is a pillarization of society, not a, mo a model or a method to reach the cohesiveness of society. If religions are impacting so powerfully on the way we're thinking and behaving as political institutions, as financial mechanisms, and as service delivery entities in a time of dire crisis, if religions are doing that which they are, then it behooves these religious actors to work together so as to even showcase that our faiths bring us together, not lead us to serve apart. And why would I want to not see that an intensive care unit I may end up in, or my family will end up in, or my friends and loved ones will end up in, why would it not matter that I notice that this is being served and delivered by Jewish and Muslim and Christian and Hindu and Buddhists together? Why would that not matter to me in that very existential moment of wondering whether I'm going to come out of this alive? It would matter to me. It would matter to the most recalcitrant of believers, those who believe in nothing. It would matter. It would send an incredibly powerful signal that the faiths are working together to serve everyone. It would send a signal of spiritual rehabilitation for our communities that are being preyed upon to be distinct, to be different, to argue with one another. It would send a very powerful signal of cohesion. It would showcase how social cohesion is possible through the faiths themselves. This is not the right time to stand in our religious silos and serve selflessly. Of course, it's wonderful that we serve selflessly, but this isn't really the right time to serve selflessly from within your own particular religious tradition or institution or NGO. This is the time to showcase very practically, very determinedly, and very actively how it is that religions can and must and do come together to serve all. Because the epidemic attacks all. The needs are the needs of all. Therefore, this is the time to serve all. And this is the time to serve governments, to showcase to those governments who would otherwise play the tune of dissent between different religious communities and, and adherents. This is the time to show the governments that we know how to stand in solidarity with one another as religious actors that in spite of what is being done to divide as religious actors serving very basic needs and advocating for the goodwill of all humanity, we can stand alongside one another and we can serve together. Dissenting discourse be damned, quite frankly. Sorry for my English. But this is the tipping point. And we are confronting a point right now where we're not willing to do that. We're not willing to undertake it. Several, uh, this is now me being a bit, a bit annoyed with what's going on in the context of this case, but I will not want to end with this glass half full. Let me, sorry, glass half empty. Let me share with you a few thoughts that can uplift a little bit to the glass half full, actually. We know without a shadow of doubt today that religious actors are fashioning, modeling, influencing, right? This whole range of discourses and existences from service delivery to inspiration. Religions at, in, and working with the United Nations system today is normal. It's no longer a big deal. In fact, it's kind of fashionable. Now, this does actually enrich the understanding, or at least the exposure, 
of these multi-religious systems own officers, the ones doing the work, the worker bees, to the realities of multi-religious dynamics. They, 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 they see it. They have to see it. Good thing. Good thing. Increasing knowledge, after all, is a prerequisite for making peace. And ignorance is the fodder for conflicts and for wars. But this also means that, per definition, civil society actors who are working with the UN system are also somehow coming face to face with these faith based entities that are also partners to the UN system. Now, many of them are not at all pleased about that. Not at all pleased to see that these religious folks are walking around pretending that they're pretending, acting, indeed serving as partners to the UN system. There are quite a few women's rights NGOs who do not find this palatable in any way, shape, or form. But you know something? A more diversified civic discourse increases the potential for more civility within multilateral establishments. So it's a win-win. And it always costs to win. Relative to 20 years ago, there are more religious actors who are much more tolerant of working with one another. Yes, I am very upset that we cannot do more now. We're not doing more now. But there is more being done together today. There are there's more of a normalcy to different religious voices coming together and sitting at the same table with the UN actors and discussing and advising and sharing and doing and serving together. There is much more of that than even in the last 20 years alone when I first started this work. This is fertile ground for more collaborative potential, which mitigates against the rampant incivility most of today's contemporary discourse so very obviously seems to engage in. Religious actors' voices are louder than ever before, but that also includes the pro-human rights voices amongst these religious communities. And they are influencing in their own ways, in many ways, more than at any other moment. In other words, the pro-human rights religious space is becoming much more of a normal today as well. Several multi-religious voices are getting much more used to coming together and carrying out negotiations and diplomacies. These are all basic necessities for making peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karam. I uh, really enjoyed um, your, your comments, your input, your very structured presentation, and uh, your very um, uh, strong um, advocacy um, towards the end that I uh, it resonated with me and I'm sure with many of our participants. I, I um, uh, not only me, but several people on uh, uh, sending questions said that the metaphor of the flamenco dance resonated with them. It made it simple to understand and uh, uh, as, as part of the main idea. Uh, there's a question there as how do you think, um, uh, this question is interested in the question in the issue of art and peace building and do you think that art uh, and artistic approach can have a role in multi-faith projects and initiatives? And do you, do you have any thoughts of how to implement that in your own institution? Uh, that's the first question. I also have several, but I want to honor the, the uh, questioners and uh, participants should feel free to send in their questions. I'm sure that many of the aspects of your talk resonated with um, our crop community, our Kyo community and people around the world. Thank you very much indeed. I actually am a full believer of the extent to which art is an expression of religious and spiritual presence in our world. Um, I need not go very far. I look at mosques, I look at the Sistine Chapel, I look at most of the um, religious institutions that we, we go to as places of worship. Um, these are establishments of artistic nature that is unbelievable in their in their direct manifestation. I am struggling, however, myself with a particular perspective that says that art as part of culture is to be distinguished from religion. Um, that somehow there are these two different divisions, units, in fact, and in, you, you see that even in, in some of the UN uh, entities that are working in this uh, cultural and educational spaces who, who indeed see this as different. You know, religion is religion and then you have culture. And I come from a school of thought in which that makes absolutely no sense. Frankly, it makes absolutely no sense. Our faiths as things that influence the way we 
believe, what we believe, how we behave, these faiths are our cultural heritage and tradition. You, you can't do culture without having that faith belief system or the lack thereof. So yes, I think that there's a very strong interconnectivity there because art is culture. Now, in fact, the same people who don't see religion as culture definitely agree that art is culture. Um, but my point is if we, if we understand culture in a much more comprehensive to be inclusive of religious beliefs and practices, then we can see that art and religion should be inseparable. In fact, they are not, we don't have to build bridges. They are inseparable in our everyday existence. But the mantra that assumes that art is distinct and, set, and you know, poetry and art and, and whatever are distinct, that mantra is a genuine challenge for me. We are hosting an assembly on women, faith and diplomacy, a global assembly in November, um, where we will invite diplomats from around the world, uh, scientists from around the world, faith, faith uh, leaders from around the world. And I ask that we have some a particular troupe that I know is extremely capable to come in and help us do some artwork together, that actually we use the opportunity of talking to, to also make art, to make art together. And there, there are several initiatives, by the way. Some of them are doing amazing work um, on that. And, and the process of, of building something artistic together, that process is indescribably powerful. It, to me, it's almost as the same as, as praying together. We, we make art together. To me, it's, it's, there's no brain power required to see how powerful that would be. And oh my goodness, how has that been difficult to ask for permission for? It's just, it's so, you know, with COVID, it's difficult to, to do that. It's, 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 we're advised against it, say some of the organizers. And I think you're advised against bringing us, bringing, to, doing artwork together, paint brushes, paper but it's okay to nevertheless come together and talk. Now, how, how does that, you know, where did we divide the making art from the talking with one another? Because it's more touching, well, we can, we can wear gloves, you know, but the, 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 it, it challenges the basic notion that there is this massive space between the two. There isn't. To be artistic is to be a believer. It's as simple as that to me. Thank you. Another question is that does the broad evangelical support base among the U.S. electorate in the perceived need for the U.S. politicians to actively serve their cause? Um, uh, and the re one example is the recent shift of the U.S. consulate to Jerusalem is, is, is an example, although unfortunate. Does that come as a, as a hindrance to the interfaith uh, peace uh, um, you know, music, uh, what's the instrument that you talk about or the interfaith peace um, component uh, that you talk about? Yes, because I think what, what we have to take into account is that the, the singers in this space, in this flamenco space, the singers are the po politicians and the politics. Um, and if they <laughs> sing a tune that is slightly off, um, it will likely impact on um the fellow or the fellows playing the guitar as well as those dancing um and i think what what using using religions and religious spaces and religious sites is perhaps to me one of the most deplorable feature of politics today and it's happening and i grew up with this in my region of the world the middle east it's kind of normal there and that's why i tell so many of our Western-based folks, well, welcome to the Middle East, because now we're beginning to see how this use of religion, discourse, sites, organizations, leaders, institutions, etc., how this use of religion is becoming a mainstream political tool, um, existence. And it, it is deeply problematic because it means that, of course, good things will happen. You know, you, you, politicians perhaps may develop a, a deeper sense of consciousness and uh, accountability. Um, they may be better listened to by all other believers if they speak in the language of all other believers. Um, so these potentials are definitely there. But the point is that usually when this happens, it's actually an indication of the lack of legitimacy that these particular political actors are suffering. So in order to complement uh, a rather complicated uh, credibility gap that they are living with as part of their political uh, instrumentalization, they then start 
looking at where the religiously motivated spaces sites issues can be useful for their credibility and legitimacy agenda. So with full respect for what is going on in the context of Jerusalem, there are some very real human rights abuses taking place in those regions, in those countries that are now very much involved in discussing and assessing how to move a political uh, body from one part of the world to another part of a space that is deeply sensitive. You kind of wonder why would that be relevant right now when there's enough, why not address the human rights abuses that are actually taking place within each of the countries that are currently partaking of this particular act of solidarity? Why not address those, um, including, including um, abuse of religious minorities and ethnic and racial minorities in those same countries? Why not tackle that um, instead of this very obvious move? Um, so yes, I think, I think it, it, it blocks the ability of us to speak within the multi-religious spaces because of course some of the religious actors who need to be very much at the table to form the dance of human rights and to shape it as believers, some of those actors are quite happy about that particular move in this space. Other actors are very happy about the move by the Turkish government to, to, to re reclassify the Hagia Sophia, for instance, as from a museum back to a mosque. Some actors are very happy with that too. And some others are deeply pained by that too. Why are, our gov are the governments finding it necessary to be working and using those spaces now? And they're the same governments that are struggling with issues of legitimacy. To me, that is not a coincidence. Several questions that I'm going to kind of summarize. Uh, several have uh, expressed how inspired they were by what you had said. And so they're looking for uh, kind of, it seems that from a practitioner's point of view, from the way you see it uh, on the ground level, uh, can you offer advice uh, to students how to, one, get further involved in interfaith and uh, peace initiatives? And um, how do they generate resilience? And, um, and how can, uh, you know, people participate in, uh, what kind of advice can you give uh, those who want to, you know, get involved more in, in the work of uh, interfaith uh, work and, and advice on resilience and some of the challenges? Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for those, for those questions as well. Um, there's a myriad ways to get involved. So let me just let me just share a couple of hints, but um, I presume that there are internship programs that um, you run um, or mm -hmm. that you certainly have a purview over in Notre Dame. It would be wonderful if some of those interreligious institutions and, and faith-based organizations could be seen as viable sites for um, sending some of the students for internships to, for instance, that would immediately engage them in those spaces and they will learn firsthand what happens in those spaces. So that's a very simple uh, idea. And we, we're always in Religions for Peace. We're constantly looking for capable students who want to spend some of their time to help us because the workload is far more than the current staff capacity. And we need, and we find ourselves extraordinarily nurtured by these students, um, by these interns who, um, the, the very latest example I'd love to share is one particular intern who's based in Argentina. And now because of this COVID has to work from Argentina. Another one was based in, in Egypt. Um, both of them contributed to not just working with us on the work itself and delivering and helping, but actually developing thought pieces on what is going on religiously in their own spaces. Our latest colleague has actually developed a, a beautiful thought piece reflecting and analyzing the encyclical of, of uh, the Pope that was just uh, signed on October 3rd. We didn't even ask it, but he, he, he felt compelled from this space to share that knowledge and insight with us. And it's absolutely Phenomenal. We're learning. We're learning from one another. And that, by the way, leads me to the point about resilience, building resilience. We know that many, many people around the world, um, eight out of 10, if we are to believe the 2012 Pew research, and I don't see any reason not to believe it, but it says eight out of 10 people will claim an affiliation with a particular religious tradition. Our massive handicap over the last 75 years of international uh, relations has been that we wanted to see religion as limited to a particular space. Huh? Both governments and multilateral entities did that. They, they preferred to limit religion to a place which is controllable and not too public, so as not to undermine their own legitimacy as governing institutions. I believe that in trying to do so, we have seriously ill-served people's beliefs 
what motivates the average individual to, to be, to exist, to serve, to serve. Um, when we were looking at volunteerism in the United Nations system as how do we build on this amazing capacity and willingness for volunteers that is very much needed by all of us working in international development, humanitarian and foreign policy, how do we build on it? There was almost a deliberate refusal to see that the largest volunteer entities in the world are actually the religious institutions. We flock to our religious institutions and communities because we want to serve. That desire for service is very hard to parallel in so many other spaces. The religious spaces have traditionally been sites for that. So how do you build resilience if you're not actually able to harvest the fruit of what people believe in and motivate them to work, to serve? How do you build resilience if you are deliberately underestimating that particular intangible and yet remarkably powerful tool for people's belief and activism. We cannot build resilience without that. So, but at the same time, we must not exploit and instrumentalize the religious in those spaces. We must be able to understand that, that we build resilience because we include people's faith in that which motivates to serve. And when we point. on the level you, of leaders, then I think we build a better resilience. Sorry, what were you saying? But, no, but, but you also pointed out to how that resilience and determination and faith can go into overdrive in the example you gave, where people don't want to share the responsibilities, but they only want to do it alone because they will get the headlines, they will get the, yeah, because people are thinking. So one, one question I asked the, uh, the, the issue in how does, uh, you know, economics and especially uh, neoliberalism, ec neoliberal economic policies shape uh, the desires of religious groups uh, and how they want to participate in in multi-faith activities and multi-faith work. Uh, do you see that? Can, can you identify that? Or is it is that uh, a, a matter that still needs to be researched? In other words, how, how people's desires and their uh, predispositions are shaped by certain kinds of market activities and to be number one, to have the largest number of hits, to say we did it all, uh, you know, and, and we are exclusive. Uh, I think that's where the question is going. Yes, uh, and, it, and it's again, another very good question. I think, I think what we need to understand is that working within religious spaces is in and of itself challenging for the secular discourse and the secular imagination um, that currently dominates a lot of the governmental and intergovernmental spaces. What do I mean? I mean that neoliberal ideas are indeed rampant, but they may not necessarily be what religious discourse is inclusive of, or even how religions would necessarily, religious leaders, religious institutions, religious NGOs would necessarily even frame their work, right? It, it's, it's a discourse that is legitimate, of course, but it belongs to a particular arena. Religious actors tend to speak in different terms. They tend to speak of that which is divinely ordained, the, the empathy, the emotion, compassion, mercy, love, things like that, that may not necessarily indeed resonate much with neoliberalism um, and such uh, terminologies that we are very used to in outside of this particular space. So I think what religions and religious engagement and engagement within religious spaces actually does is it sensitizes us to different forms of discourse. Uh, and different manners of identifying perhaps exactly the same phenomenon you know so some religious actors will say well that's just plain greed if you read the pope's encyclical on the environment you can see that there's 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 no talk necessarily of here's what neoliberalism does actually there is but the conversation is couched not in terms of neoliberalism but in terms of greed quite frankly and how it goes awry um, because it can it can take away from human dignity rather than add to the sense of fraternity which is required for human dignity so there is the conversation going on everywhere, but the terminology sometimes is different. But what I wanted to share with you is this, and I have to emphasize this significantly. When religious organizations and communities are working in their own spaces together, like I said, there's a particular momentum and discourse and whatever, whatever. It's, it's, it's unique to those religious uh, language discursive spaces. When religions work together, Something else happens, Ibrahim and colleagues. Something else happens when religions come together, when they have to work together to actually deliver concrete things together, whether it's building of an ICU tent or whether it is de delivering food and medicines or whether it is even, even the act of worship together. 
something else is taking place in those spaces that is almost impossible to describe and even less possible to consider quantifying. But that particular multi-religious space is deeply challenging, both to the traditional secular spaces, the way we do our work, but it is also deeply challenging for the religions inter-religiously, meaning when we come together as Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Hindu, etc., to do something together, even worship, but it can also be actual service delivery, right? Building a school, teaching, that you name it, the range of services that are provided is immense. But when we have to come together across our religious differences, we develop a common language, which means that I, as a Muslim, have to take into account your sensibility and sensitivity about the use of certain words or the use of certain allegories. So I adjust to that, as you will adjust to my sensitivity about certain ways of speaking. Do we speak about God when we have a multi religious Do we speak about the divine? We, we adjust our language to one another's sensitivities and sensibilities. It's a very difficult thing for traditional religious institutions and religious leaders to do. And yet, many of them do. Now, what happens when you adjust linguistically to the sensitivities of those around you from different religious traditions? Something in our mind changes because it isn't just the language that we're using. We're also forced to think of what that means, what that could imply from not just here, but here and here. What does it mean to take into account your different perception of the divine and how that divine operates? Something changes in our mindsets and it changes forever. And that's the kind of change that we're trying to build because it is good. Because diversity and what it forces upon us in terms of being able to appreciate the divine and the human manifestation thereof and the natural obligations there too. Because when that change happens, it really isn't a bad thing at all. On the contrary, it is, I believe very firmly, it is the antidote to the hatred, to the discrimination, to the sense of polarization that has today become our normal. The antidote is multi-religious discourse, actions and engagements with civic spaces. Well, that, 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 what you just uh, shared there uh, is also what is established that, you know, language constitutes reality. You know, we just don't describe, but it constitutes a, a reality and you push. I was going to give you a, 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 a little bit of pushback on this uh, liberal, uh, 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 neoliberalism question and saying that, you know, in don't uh, or don't religious communities reflect what is going on in larger societies? But then I was reminded that, you know, not everywhere is, is it neoliberal. There are different kinds of things in different parts of the world. So neoliberalism is one, although it is also growing uh, uh, extremely uh, dominant, but, but it does because it seems that also one element is the question of competition, right? Whereas religious traditions want to compete and say, you know, we did that. And it's just like, you know, creating a, 403, uh, 401k, you know, how much do you have, how much is your stock worth today? Uh, so that's a kind of a, 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 a neoliberal uh, yeah. kind of device that has shaped our, even our religious emotions. But you, you counted well by saying, you know, uh, the encyclical talks about greed and most religions talk about greed and how we need to take control of ourselves. So um, I, 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 you, you've helped me to, to think through some of those issues. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe, Ibrahim, if I may also just add one. Yes, thing. yes, yes, yes. Multi-religious collaboration fundamentally challenges neoliberal tendencies within religious actors and institutions as uh, well, right? So every, you mentioned it, competition, the order of the day, including, of course, with religious NGOs. My goodness gracious me, we would be silly not to acknowledge how we compete with one another. So. If, if you will, neoliberalist tendencies are defining a great deal of the discourse and actions that are being undertaken, including within the religious institutions and traditions. Hence, even more an argument for the fact that when you work multi-religiously, multi-stakeholder capacity, you challenge the individual tendencies that will only see me, myself, and I, institution organization, versus the common good. It mutes, uh, my colleague Atalia Omar would like this, what I say now is that it will mute the triumphalism that individual and group religions uh, uh, yeah, you, you always thrive on. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that you um, mentioned that um, is that how does your organization, Religious for Peace, for instance, be able to overcome and negotiate the tensions between government NGOs, government and NGOs, especially in places where there is not a thriving relationship, as you, in, to use your words, 
between governments and NGOs? What, what could be a difficult and tough case that you might, might want to share if something, if one comes to mind or, or your kind of, your, your general? Sure. Uh, well, I, would, I would, I think this, that's a beautiful question. There's many examples um, within the Religions for Peace, uh, peace building. Uh, sites and spaces of engagement. I would mention particularly our colleagues in um, Eastern Europe, um, the Bosnian colleagues, uh, how they managed to work multi-religiously with one another in the context of building an inter-religious council um, several years ago at the height of the tensions that were taking place in the then former Yugoslavia, building an inter-religious council in Bosnia that would take, that would represent all the different religious leaders equally so that there was no no priority given to any one particular religious communities in spite of the obvious majority that is there. But the building of such a council in and of itself constituted peace building in action, in making between the religious spaces, but it wasn't just between the religious spaces because it was about how you serve the entire communities, all of them in their diversity. The interreligious councils are built to serve all, to represent all and to serve all. And in the process of building, one is not just engaging with the religious actors, one is engaging with the very heartbeat, the pulse of the whole community and the government that is meant to serve uh, in some representative way and preside over clear and obvious tensions of representation, credibility, legitimacy, you name it. The act of building an interreligious council became such a seminal point of engagement, of, of debate and tension for sure, but ultimately the objective was, and sh shared by all, government included, to build an interreligious council of religious leaders representing everyone, serving, not just there to stand to grandstand and issue speeches, but actually serving practically at the community level. We see a similar example in the Albanian interreligious religious council, as soon as plenty of dissent that the country is going through, COVID struck disaster in a context where there's plenty of need and a lot of dissent, the interreligious council kicks into action to serve all to support the government in delivering supplies, much needed uh, supplies to all communities. It became a partner to the government in that space actually COVID is a blessing in disguise in that particular context because the interreligious collaborative service component, not advocacy only, service component, defined, translated the political tensions into actually ways of working together, precisely the same actors who could add fuel to the fire, but they work together to serve. Together. That's why Religious for Peace created a multi-religious humanitarian fund, because we realized these are some very real examples that have to be supported in different countries. And we made an appeal to all the faith-based organizations out there saying, come to pool together the resources so that you can serve and encourage at the national and regional and global level, encourage that collaborative action that is not just religious. It is driven by the religious leadership and the empathy and the feelings and the institutions, but it is meant to serve all. Please come together and serve. I'm still waiting for a faith-based organization to see value in that. I, I have a I have a question um, uh, from some someone who came in very early already, um, and that is that you know it was it dealt deal with dealing with Africa, and I just want to honor the questioner and um, uh, what the questioner had asked. So the question is asked about you know multi faith society. You've re already addressed that the road to peace in that, but the the question was asking uh, the role of religion in in and culture in violence in Africa? I, I think it's a kind of a predictable question, but I think maybe the, uh, if I put a, 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 a gloss on that would be, you know, people might be thinking about Rwanda, uh, what happened uh, is ethnic, but does religion have a, have a role to play in that? Maybe, I don't know, but you know, what's that? the question also asked about Nigeria, uh, which there are tensions from time to time, but how would you frame some of those challenges um, uh, not only in Africa, but elsewhere too. I mean, you, you mentioned in your opening uh, remarks in your presentation about what happened in Myanmar and India and other parts of the world. So um, do you have some, some advice for this question? I think we, we often make the mistake, and I certainly have been guilty of that in the past, of saying, okay, now because we're trying to make the case for why religions matter, that it sounds as if we're saying religions are all good. And actually that is absolutely not what is being maintained here. 
What I am saying very clearly is that precisely because religions, discourse, leaders, institutions, non-governmentally affiliated actors, precisely because the realms of religion can be deeply divisive, and indeed are, indeed are, that is why religions and religious institutions and religious entities have to be engaged with marginalizing them into the all bad category, the problematic category, is what the United Nations system tried to do for 75 years. Well, 70, maybe. But the point is, you, you, you can't avoid engaging with religious actors. If people believe, as most people do, they have a belief system, getting involved and understanding this belief and where it comes from, and admit, even if you don't wish to agree, at least respecting it, that is taking into account part of a human physiology part of a social ecosystem of people. Today, because religions are causing such, dis causing such, such disruptions between the different political actors, governmental and non-governmental, because religions are part of the dissent process, because religions are part of the competitive space process, because religions are neoliberal actors too in this space, because of that, they must be actively engaged with. So there is an interreligious council in Nigeria that is doing some remarkable work with the religious communities and governmental and secular NGOs and academia. They're doing wonderful work, but are we focused on that? No, we're, some of us are, and we're going and creating alternative interreligious spaces so that they can nicely compete with one another. Really, really smart stuff. I'm being sarcastic. We, we tend to approach the multi-religious spaces also in a very problematic way, which is why the idea to say, let's come together and serve, support multi-religious collaboration, not in the name of any one particular organization, not in the name of any one particular actor, but actually together multi-religiously, right? That idea is deeply threatening. It's deeply threatening because as, as religious actors themselves are part of the dissent and warfare that is taking place in different parts of the world. It is also in their interest and in the interest of those who support them to either support this perpetuation of discourse. No, they're right. We should support them. We must support them. Let's all try to support them because they're defending minorities or they're defending. That's grand. But the point is, you can't defend religious minorities by just insistently defending religious minorities. You have to work with everybody to make sure that every religious voice has an equal sense of dignity and space and presence, even when it is a minority or whether it is a majority, that religious freedom for one community will never guarantee the religious freedom for all. And if you don't have religious freedom for all, you will always have minorities that are given a very, very rough deal indeed. And the same thing happens in warfare. You cannot approach a negotiated settlement between any different religious parties by focusing on only one of them. You must engage them simultaneously and you must try to provide the ground where they are equals and equals with one another, but also equals with other non-religious stakeholders in that space. Interreligious modalities are very critical to this, but using interreligious modalities as a way to further competition between different groups, governmental or non-governmental, even between religious groups, that's also very not smart. Using interreligious modalities as sites and spaces for cohesion, that is an area that requires tremendous investment still, but only on the basis of the fact that you're working interreligiously, multi-religiously, and making sure that that multi-religious work is part of this civil society space, not siloing the work with religions. That is one of the worst things we can do also. We cannot silo multi-religious or inter-religious or religious work as a standalone thing we do in our respective ministries or schools or NGOs. No, multi-religious work is civic engagement. And all actors have to come around the table because it's not that some people are believers and some aren't and the majority aren't, so therefore we work with the majority separately in a secular space and then we work with those few in a religious space. No, unless and until the religious sectors in their diversity become equal participants in a civic entity and space and are seen as equal partners in that civic space by the seculars as well as by other specific religious groups, unless and until it becomes a whole of civil society engagement approach, we are actually creating dissent in those communities. I think that uh, maybe your last comments uh, could uh, already address uh, this questioner, but maybe I repeat it to honor the questioner. 
how can international actors work with local faith-based faith organizations without reifying traditions that may marginalize certain groups such as women or religious, or religious minorities? Now, you did emphasize the question of multi-faith multi traditions working with civil society, but if you have any specific uh, response to that, how, how can one, without reifying the tradition? You reify certain religious discourse when you work with it on its own. Hmm. You very much run the risk, in fact, it's part of the collateral damage, of reifying hmm. the good, the bad, and the not so good, okay? When you work with religions individually, independently. You may do amazing work with them and within them, but you're still reifying them. And therefore, my advocacy that I shared with you, and one of the number one goals of the UN Interagency Task Force on Engaging with Religious Actors, the number one guideline is work multi-religiously. And it's not that you work with the Christians separately and the Muslims separately and the Hindus separately. Yes, of course, if you need to do that, by all means do that. But the point is you have to bring them together systematically, deliberately. The United Nations is the United Nations of the world. It doesn't bring out one particular group or community. The Security Council is particularly problematic because it does reify specific countries. It does give them absolute and total control over the fate of everybody else. It's a specific group of countries with something called a permanent veto. It is why our United Nations system suffers, hobbles so much as it serves so much, but it is hobbled by the way that it is reifying particular nations and countries who are making the decision on behalf of all. We must never do that with religions. We do it when we work individually with religions, even when we work ecumenically, because ecumenical is still Christian. Sorry, but you know, from the rest of the world, ecumenical is still Christian. It may include a massive group of billions of people. It is still only Christians. We reify when we work individually we must work multi-religiously. That's why Religions for Peace, Parliament of World Religions, United Religious Initiatives, that's why, they work, that's why these organizations exist. It is to bring together. Because you cannot reify anyone when they all have to be at the table as peers. Then they all actually, and this is my experience over 30 years of bringing different religious groups and communities together, my experience is that when they all come around the table, day number one is often spent in each one claiming superiority and uh, special uh, status over everybody else, day two, when we're now going to work together and figuring out how and what each one is doing, becomes a site for positive competition about which one of them is actually more merciful than the other. And that, that is what I'm trying to get at. That's the magic of multi-religious collaboration. They cannot reify their glorious selves anymore when they are alone, when they realize that they are with others representing billions at the same spaces, there's a certain humbling and yet remarkable grace that takes place because then it's about serving and serving all and being better at serving everyone. And that's not a bad thing to see religions do. Try to compete, yes, but compete over mercy. Who is the more merciful, the more compassionate, and the more loving? I'll have that competition any day. I think any one of us would take that kind of competition any day. And ultimately they have to work together to make sure that that does actually happen. I, uh, thank you, that was a great answer. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, you know, in our news, it's not covered much, uh, but I was the other day, I, I had to um, participate in the BBC and there Nogorno Karnabakh was on the front you know, news there, this territorial conflict between, um, uh, where Azerbaijan is involved, and it seems that there's a certain kind of sensitivity going around in some listservs and so on, that's saying you know, Turkey and Azerbaijan number over 100 million, while Armenia is just below 3 million. Is, is there a, is, so this is a question from ignorance because I have not studied this question, is there a religious dynamic involved there or is this purely territorial disputes? And can I talk like that, this or purely territorial, because all territories come with some uh, norms in the ground, right? Yes, so... Um, uh, yeah, 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 yes. If, 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 if this is not on the front of, of your thinking, I have another question for you. Okay, no, that's fine. It is definitely at the front of all our thinking because it's, it's an issue that involves communities. Communities include religions and religious actors within them. So by implication, as it involves the United Nations of actors and governmental actors, it involves the United Nations of religious actors in some way, shape, or form. And the question right now that is unfolding is how? How can we serve 
this space in the most, um, if you will, diligent, uh, dignifying manner to all who are involved. I have to say, and I, I will respond as a scholar rather than as, a, as the SG of a, of a multi-religious organization. As a scholar, I would have to say there's no way anymore that we can, I, I mentioned in my presentation that almost all, that there is this flamenco dance where politics, religion, and human rights are fundamentally dependent and intertwined and enacting our lives today. So quite frankly, you cannot say anymore that one thing is only territorial, it's not religious. As, as soon as any issue and conflict is identified, part of the whole fact that now religion seems to be the big thing and everybody's talking religiously and everybody's using, politi political actors are using religious spaces, part of the, the detritus of that is that what could be a non-religious issue and should really be seen as, can we keep the religion stuff out of it, what could be that is anyway labeled with that because the, poli the, po the political actors are bringing the religious sentiments into the space and the religious actors are quite happy to be brought into that political space because it gives them more power and visibility and maybe they can get a few churches or territories or, or mosques back to their own uh, presidium of oversight. So unfortunately, the interest base is shared between the political and the religious actors on some of these issues. So even where the political should have been in some cases wiser to say, can we just keep the religious out of this for a while? Let's not get those inflamed sentiment into those spaces. Let's, let's try to deal with this. I'm not quite sure how you deal with it without the religious sentiment, but perhaps, perhaps we could look at examples in history where some of the most conflictual territorial aspects had to be dealt with without dragging in the religious institutions and actors into the space, appreciating them, consulting with them, being sensitive to their needs, yes, but involving the sentiments and the institutions and the territories in an already existing territorial hotbed is not very smart in my way of thinking, and yet is the normal in today's political spaces. So we have to look at Nagorno-Karabakh as its historical political precedents clearly show and indicate. There's plenty history that this conflict is reflecting. There's also plenty rot in the political systems on all sides in our contemporary world that this conflict and many others are also reflecting. But we cannot afford to see it as now devout of religion and religious sentiments because religious sentiments have been brought in and religious institutions are being brought in anyway. So how then do actors who are trying to convene the multi-religious spaces in the civic and political dialogue, how then do we react to this? We're honestly still trying to understand how best to serve. How do you argue, as I do, that we must not engage and use the, the religious as a, a crutch. A crutch, thank you. How can we not do that? And at the same time, how then do we get involved in such a way that we can lessen this particular tension so that it honors all sentiments, all religions? How can we do that if it is the crutch? That is a massive question. I don't think we have, we have any blueprint or solutions to it. What we are living with today, as again, the Arab Spring taught us all, is we're actually trying to figure out what to do in real time. All of us are trying to figure out what to do in real time. There is no blueprint. In this particular case, because the, politi the political has succeeded in making the religious part of the political quagmires in every context, we now, as actors on the multi-religious space of things have to figure out how, how can we position. And there are examples. I gave the example of Bosnia, Albania, many, many other examples, Myanmar. Fantastic examples of how the religious actors can come together with their political and even sometimes military spaces and try to negotiate some kind of a cohesive uh, appreciation. But it takes, it takes a remarkable amount of time and they have to be invited. The religious actors have to be, especially those who are not based in those regions must be invited. Otherwise, nobody, quite frankly, has any role to play by deciding that they have something good to share. I have nothing to share. And unless and until our religious leaders are actively sought by the local actors, nobody has anything to say or should have any role to play unless and until they are invited by the local actors. So uh, I've just uh, reached the two minute mark and I, uh, Lisa is going to call me to close, but I, I cannot uh, suppress this question and you could also keep it brief and we can talk about it again. So in the uh, two encyclicals, uh, encyclicals that we had, uh, the one on environment, uh, Pope Francis invoked Hawass, uh, a very important Sufi mystic who Shahrani's mentor from your, the land of, of your birth, uh, Egypt. 
And then in this one, there's a kind of a warm relationship with Sheikh Tayyab uh, of the uh, Al Azhar, Dr. He, the head of the Al Azhar. So, I mean, it's interesting how this warm relationship in the, in the encyclicals uh, are forming with Islam. And I was wondering, or with Muslim communities, or with one Muslim community, not necessarily Iran for that matter or so. Um, and, I, and I know this, this, this current Pope also has many critics from within the church. So I wonder how, what are you hearing and how you think this is playing out and, and, and how should we interpret that? So, so in truth, the last few years have witnessed some remarkable rapprochement between different Christian communities and organizations. There was a, there was a very, very um, warm and powerful rapprochement between the Holy See and the Lutheran Church uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of rapprochement between the um, patriarch uh, of the Orthodox Church uh, based in Istanbul, but who refers to himself as the patriarch of Cos Constantinople, which um, is of course politically incorrect for uh, some member states. But th that church community and this particular amazing patriarch who we all refer to, he has earned the title of being the green patriarch. He was, he was about ecology and environment years before it was on the global agenda. Um, but there's been a beautiful evolving rapprochement between the Vatican, the Catholic community and the Orthodox community. Uh, there's been uh, years of sustained rapprochement between Jewish leadership and community and the Vatican. So we must be able to see the, the, the comprehensive story, the totality of the picture that actually the Vatican has for some, some significant years, at least since um, the second uh, the Pope II encyclical, there's been so much deliberate engagement and rapprochement with different religious communities. Now it is much more manifest with the Muslim uh, especially Sunni Islamic community, but also with many Shia religious leaders who are today claiming very rightly that they have a very good relationship with the, with the Holy Father. So I think we must be able to appreciate that this has been going on, but we don't see it from our respective political science and international relations spaces because we're so busy focusing on the hair terrorism and the violence and the da 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 da. We don't see that there's actually been some remarkable. Um, interreligious rapprochement. So I, I urge us to see what's going on with the Muslim uh, establishment, particularly Al-Azhar over the last year or so, two years actually, as a continuity in the spectrum of the, the Vatican and the Holy Pope's attempts to indeed uh, re-energize the spiritual uh, brotherhood uh, of the world. And I think he must be given credit for that. Detractors notwithstanding, this has been his agenda and the agenda of his predecessors, by the way, for some time. It's just that it goes under the radar. So now having said that, we have Al-Azhar, a grand imam, who also, by the way, has his own detractors in his own part of the world as he extends the hand of fraternity and, and thinks and sits and nourishes spiritually together with the, with the father. They think together. They they. In some ways, they worship through their spiritual engagement and dialogue together. And we see the results of this in the, the document on human fraternity, which came out with, with some significant rightful fanfare last year. Um, indeed, the, the Grand Imam is also one of Religions for Peace's uh, uh, board and representatives, because he represents Al-Azhar there. And we were, we were immediately made aware of the fact that this document on global for, uh, on human fraternity is a very seminal document because it, it, it informs our own religious traditions at the same time that it is actually building linkages between the largest religious establishments and institutions of the world. Few people understand that Al-Azhar is to a certain extent the Vatican of the Sunni Muslim world to as much as it is possible to have something like that when you have such different institutional uh, ways of acting, but it is a very foundational space for Sunni Muslim, Sunni Muslims around the world. So here are the two largest establishments of Catholic institutional uh, tradition and, and Sunni Islamic institution coming together in discourse. And we see the results in the document on global for, uh, human fraternity, which is indeed a precedent. So the, 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 the Pope was indeed working on this encyclical as he and his group and team of, of advisors and, and, and uh, esteemed cardinals were also co um, birthing this document of global human fraternity. So yes, there is, this is part of the rapprochement with this particular religious community 
building on the lessons and the wisdom and the established relationships with the other Christian and Jewish communities around the world, this is part of that process. Let us see it and let us rejoice in it as part of that process of spiritual rapprochement between the largest religious communities in the world. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it, it now behooves me to thank uh, Professor uh, Azakaram for her very energetic and also very inspiring, inspiring and, 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 and I believe deservingly passionate um, uh, conversation on issues that touch us all. And so thank you very much on behalf of the Crock Institute, the Kiyo School of Global Affairs, University of Notre Dame. I thank you for your time and for your dedication uh, uh, to this event. And for our audience who, before they check off, remember that next week uh, on the uh, October the 13th at 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, the 27th Annual Hesburgh Lecture in Ethics and Public Policy uh, is a conversation that Dr. Angela Davis, a uh, world-renowned activist, scholar, educator, will have uh, on a whole range of issues with uh, Dr. David Hooker uh, from the Kroc Institute. So see you all there next week. And uh, thank you once again, Azza, for your wonderful time. Ma salama. Bye. Bye-bye. Peace. Take care.